Let's talk about bank debt products. These types of products are usually extended by banks naturally, and they are more senior in nature. When they deal with companies, especially middle market companies, they usually have to do with a specific purpose, such as trade financing, inventory financing, or others. Let's take a look at all the different types of bank debt. And I warn you, there's a couple of them. Although banks may provide a myriad of other services, including trading, broking, underwriting, and so on in capital markets, for example, lending is always at their core, taking deposits and turning them into loans. And for this reason, debt products are usually standardized. They are usually senior debt, which is secured with some collateral. And I mean this in comparison with other types of debt, such as mezzanine debt or bonds, which are usually junior. So bank debt is senior. It's usually one of the first to be repaid. And it's secured with some form of collateral. It's also usually low risk and low reward when compared to other types of debt. If you know about that, you know this. Low risk, low yield. So a mezzanine loan may charge, for example, 20% interest, while a bank loan may charge 6% interest. But of course, these rates may be floating, they may be completely different in your country, or even in the year that you're reading this. But anyway, bank products usually include first, term loans, very simple, individual or corporate. A given amount of capital, the principal, over a given amount of time, the maturity, mortgages, auto loans, and others for individuals, and for corporations, for any use that they may have. Then we have revolving credit facilities, or RCFs. These are facilities that allow a borrower to borrow and repay as many times as possible, as long as you don't cross a certain threshold. These can include overdraft facilities, liquidity facilities, which are usually for emergencies, credit cards, or forms of lending known as ABL, or asset-based lending, which we'll cover later. But they consist of the borrower obtaining a loan using specific assets as collateral, which are usually inventory or accounts receivable, which will be liquidated anyway in the future. So these are used as collateral and they're liquidated later to pay for the loan. It also includes a specific type called factoring, where the bank actually buys the rights to the accounts receivable of the borrower. In short, the customer of the company now owes the bank and not the company. They become their creditor and they advance a part of that money to the business. The big difference between a term loan and a revolving credit facility is that in a term loan, you will obtain one quantity of capital for one maturity. For example, 50 million for five years, done. In a revolving credit facility, you would have a limit, for example, 5 million for five years, and you can borrow and repay as many times as needed. The simplest example is a credit card. If you have a limit of 5 million, you can borrow as much as you want under that limit, pay it back, and borrow again. Usually, all other types of debt are some form of these two. Next comes trade finance, and this is usually to help businesses navigate international transactions, which may include companies that they don't know, different currencies, or different political climates. And the relevant instruments include letters of credit, or LCs. These are guarantees by a bank that a customer will pay when goods are received but only if goods are received, or PO financing, purchase order financing, where the borrower obtains a loan to satisfy a purchase order, saying, hey, we have a purchase order for 10 million of product. We need a loan to actually create that product, or forfeiting, which is similar to factoring above. In this case, the bank buys the rights to a set of goods being imported. So again, the exporter doesn't own the borrower, they own the bank now. And the bank usually advances a part of this to the borrower. Another type is project finance. 
This is financing long-term infrastructure projects, usually with governments or corporates, where the project, as it's developed, starts to generate capital that repays the loan. For example, a highway that, as it's being built, charges tolls and uses that cash flow to pay for the rest of the highway. Another type are money market facilities, which are usually unsecured short-term loans for businesses. They are usually for small operational needs. Maybe a company turns to the bank and says, hey, we need one million to pay back in 30 days. If they're credit worthy, the bank will accept that. Then we have leases. Instead of borrowing to obtain an amount of capital, you borrow to obtain equipment temporarily. You can lease cars, machinery, or others. So in a way, your lease payments are loan payments. For someone who is not familiar to that, these may sound like two distinct mechanisms, but they are very similar. And leases can be short-term or long-term, and with or without transferring ownership of the assets at the end of the period which are called operational leases or financial leases. And finally, we have syndicated loans. Although these aren't technically a product, they are a common characteristic of bad products themselves. So in each of these, the bank doesn't actually provide most of the capital. They do what's called the syndication of a loan from multiple debt investors. And these charge a fee for arranging the loan or for managing it. Starting with term loans, these are usually very simple. The borrower must repay an amount in a given amount of time, which is known as the principle of the loan. For example, 5 million, 50 million, whatever it is. They may be secured or not. They may be short term or long term, anything from one year to 10 years or 20. And the interest rate of these is usually floating. That means it changes when the interbank rate that is based on changes as well, such as the LIBOR or URIBOR. The payment is usually one of two types. Either it's what is called bullet, where the full amount of the principal is paid at the end of the period. For example, you borrow 5 million for five years, so you pay those 5 million in full after the five years, or it's amortized, where the principal is split and is paid together with the interest throughout the period, for example, with a mortgage. So if you borrow 100 million for 10 years, those 100 million are divided by years and then maybe by quarters, depending on the payment period. In every period, you pay the interest plus that part of the principal. In bullet repayment, you only pay the interest periodically and you pay the full principal at the end. There's a whole variety of repayment modalities for both the principal and the interest, but these are just examples. Revolving credit lines, also known as RCFs, are credit facilities that allow a borrower to borrow as many times as needed up to a certain amount and repeat this as many times as they wish within that credit limit and that period. So unlike term loans where you borrow once, here you can borrow countless times as long as you pay it back. The most common example, again, are credit cards. But there's also other types. First, overdraft facilities. These are facilities that allow an account holder at a bank to go over the account balance temporarily if you've personally spent more than your account balance in any situation, you've probably received an overdraft fee. Because you're going over that limit, you're spending bank money. You're getting a temporary loan. So usually, there's no specific period to repay these. But banks do take the initiative after 30 or 60 days. For example, you have a bank account with 4 million. One month, you spend 4.5 million. So now, you're half a million in overdraft. Maybe at the end of the month, the company receives two million again. So the bank may take that half a million back after a month or two or another period. Then we have liquidity facilities. These are usually credit facilities 
that are just used for emergencies. For example, the business is perfectly healthy, but in case they need to, they have this type of credit facility maybe for 5 million. So maybe one month, they need 2 million, and then they pay it back. And then there's no emergency for another year, and so on. Then we have asset-based lending, which we'll cover in the next slide. But what happens is the following. When you obtain a loan or credit, something must be used as collateral. And this can be cash flow, it can be specific assets, it can even be the reputation of the borrower. Asset-based lending uses super specific assets as collateral, and only those. And these specific assets are always liquidated at the end of the loan to pay back the loan. So this is a type of lending that's very good for temporary assets, such as inventory or accounts receivable. For example, you have a 300,000 asset-based facility, you use 1 million of inventory as collateral, and then later you sell that inventory, you liquidate it, and you pay back the 300,000. And then maybe you produce another 1 million of inventory, and maybe you use asset-based lending again with that 1 million as the specific collateral, and so on as many times as you need. So as mentioned, ABL is usually used with temporary assets because they're a perfect match for a type of loan where you have to liquidate the collateral anyway. Out of curiosity, it's also used for investment funds, such as a venture capital or a private equity fund. And the assets used are the portfolio company shares. Because if you think about it, they will perform what's called an exit in a couple of years. So they will liquidate their shares in the company at a profit. And out of curiosity, those are called NAV facilities, or net asset value facilities. Instead of a company borrowing 100 million and the temporary asset is the inventory as collateral, it's an investment fund raising 100 million or 1 billion, and the temporary asset is the portfolio company shares. So it's another example. In terms of ABL, there is a specific type which is factoring. So factoring works a little bit differently. In this case, the bank actually purchases the accounts receivable of the business. They become a creditor to that business's customer who must pay. So instead of a business borrowing 300,000 based on 1 million of accounts receivable, they do factoring with the bank. So the bank becomes the creditor of that 1 million of accounts they are going to collect from the customer. And usually, a part of that 1 million is immediately advanced to the borrower. This is a win-win because the bank has more power to collect that debt and charges a fee for doing so, while the borrower wins because they get an immediate portion of that advanced. It's almost like asking the bank for help in collecting your debts and paying them a fee for doing so. In fact, I think that's exactly it. This is very good especially with problematic customers that the borrower can't easily collect from, but the bank can. There are also specific debt products that help with trade finance, that is, debt that supports imports or exports or international activities in general, because you may be working with suppliers that you don't know, or buyers that you don't know, or import tariffs that you are not familiar with, so banks can really help in these cases. So first, there's forfeiting, and this is very similar to what we mentioned with factoring. In this case, instead of the bank taking control of the accounts receivable and becoming the creditor, they do exactly the same for imported goods. For example, you're a business and you order 1 million of machinery from another continent. Instead of you being worried about what may happen, the bank takes control of it and they say, hey, you are going to get that machinery, but we are going to get a slice of the value of those goods. And the bank makes sure that everything works. The risk of the goods not arriving, being late, import problems. So it's almost like insurance in a way. They make sure you get the goods and they charge a fee for doing so. Another type, which is very common, are letters of credit, or LC. This is not exactly a type of debt, but it's related. 
It's a type of guarantee. So in a letter of credit, the bank acts as an intermediary. It's usually the bank of the purchaser or importer of the goods. And this happens when there's distrust. The importer doesn't know if they'll get the goods. And the exporter doesn't know if they'll get paid. So the bank comes in between the two and they represent the importer. So the party that is going to pay. And the bank deals with the exporter issuing an official letter saying, hey, when the goods arrive, this borrower is going to pay. We'll make sure of it. But they will only pay if the goods are received. So this makes it safer for both parties because the exporter knows that they'll get paid and the importer knows that the goods have to arrive before they pay. And the bank naturally charges a fee. And finally, PO financing or purchase order financing. It's very similar to inventory financing. So you get a loan to fulfill an inventory or a purchase order. In this case, it's usually a purchase order from an international client. So let's say the following. You want to borrow 5 million from the bank, but they won't accept it in normal conditions. But if you go to them and say, hey, we have a purchase order for 10 million. Now the bank says, okay, here's your 5 million, go create your product, go fulfill that order. So you borrow from the bank using the purchase order as a sort of collateral. And naturally, the bank charges interest for this. Another type is project finance. And this is a specific type of long-term lending for projects. And these are usually situations where the bank works very closely with the entity that's executing the project. It's usually something related to infrastructure, maybe a power plant or a highway, and the borrower may even be a government or a big corporation. And what happens is that the continual development of the project will result in revenue that pays off the loan over time. So the project pays for itself as it's being built. For example, lending to a government to build a highway. They need, I don't know, 100 million to build the first part. Then the toll money starts coming in and it starts to pay off the debt. And then they have more cash flow to finance the development of the project. Or maybe a factory where the first part of the factory is done and it starts to produce whatever product it is, starts to generate cash flow, and finances the rest of it as it's being developed. Another type are money market facilities. And these are a type of credit facility that is usually short-term and unsecured. These are usually only provided to very credit-worthy businesses. They are based, for example, on commercial paper. So when I mean very credit-worthy, I mean it. This is, for example, Apple saying to the bank, hey, we need 200 million for a quick project and we'll pay you back in two months. And the bank provides it. They are kind of a simpler and shorter version of other credit facilities. But because they're unsecured, they really are just for very credit worthy businesses. If you are, I don't know, Joe's Bakery, you are not going to get this. Then we have leases. Leases are a variation of that where the bank doesn't provide capital, but they provide equipment. Usually, it's not the bank's equipment, they act as an intermediary. So, what happens is that you pay interest periodically, not for any amount of capital that you've borrowed, such as 100 million, but for a piece of equipment that may be worth 100 million. So, leases technically can be operational or financial. And I'm getting into details here. It's a subtle distinction. Operational leases are shorter term, and the lessee does not take ownership of the asset. Financial leases are long term, and the lessee may take ownership of the asset to later liquidate it. And you guessed it, that's a form of ABL, because it's used as collateral. Then we have syndicated loans. Out of curiosity, they're not really a product that is transparent to a borrower, but they are the mechanism behind the majority of bank loans. In most cases where you borrow 100 million or even 100 bucks, it's not the bank that provides most of that capital. They search for credit investors with a matching profile, and each one takes a piece. Remember, 
By definition, banks are intermediaries, not the providers of capital. They syndicate the investors. It's important to know that syndicated loans can be committed or best effort. The difference becomes clear when enough money for a loan has not been gathered, which is called underfinancing. For example, as a company, you ask for 100 million and only 80 million has been syndicated. If the loan is committed, that means that the bank commits to put up the rest of the money. So in this case, they would put up the other 20 million. In best effort loans, the bank has no responsibility. So they turn to you and they say, hey, we can do an 80 million loan or we can't do anything else. In other words, this defines whether the bank assures the rest of the money or not if it's lacking. In a syndication, the bank usually acts as what is called the arranger of the loan or possibly the manager and they charge a fee for both of these. So let me clarify. The arranger is the entity that originates a loan because every investment opportunity is worth money. So the arranger fee is kind of a finder's fee. It's to the entity that found the loan. The manager of the loan may be the arranger or not. It's the entity that, as the name says, manages the loan. They deal with issues such as due diligence on the borrower, dealing with faults, documentation, refinancing, and other issues. The arranger may be the manager as well or not. It usually is, but not necessarily. For example, let's say that there is a bank that only deals with construction companies. But one day, maybe their cousin calls them and says, hey, we have a chemicals company that needs a loan. So the bank may arrange the loan because it came from them, but they say, hey, we don't want to manage it. It's not our area of expertise. One of you other investors that knows about chemicals, take care of it. So they can be the same or not. What are some examples of bank debt products? The first are overdraft facilities. They're available for individuals as well. If you've ever personally went over your bank account limit, you probably had to pay an overdraft fee. That was the interest payment for that temporary loan. And by the way, usually when an overdraft is not negotiated beforehand, you are charged a lot more than usual. So if you've already agreed with the bank that you can go over that limit and maybe pay 5%, that's what happens. But if you haven't negotiated and you go over the limit, you may pay 20% or more of that amount. It's kind of an unpredictable loan or a sudden loan, if you will. Then, asset-based lending, as we mentioned, is good for temporary assets. Usually, in fact, there's two types of lending, cash flow-based lending and asset-based lending. Cash flow-based lending naturally uses the cash flow as collateral, or if it doesn't use it as collateral, at least is based on that cash flow. Asset-based lending is secured by specific assets like inventory or accounts receivable or portfolio company shares and it's only repaid by liquidating those assets. So even if the company has other sources of repayment, it doesn't matter. It has to be repaid from liquidating the assets. In this specific format is what makes it great for temporary assets, which is why it's used for inventory, for leases, for portfolio investments, or any other temporary asset type. And finally, bank debt is usually senior and secured. There are many types of debt, both public and private. And out of these, bank debt is usually always senior and always secured. There are very few exceptions to this, such as short-term money market facilities, which are unsecured. So if you know about the different types of debt, you will know that bank debt is always above investment grade because nobody is going to rate the debt of a bank as having risk. So it's a kind of low risk, but also low yield type of debt. The interest rates are lower because the risk is low. In return, it usually has much higher demands or covenants than other types of debt. 
In other words, with mezzanine debt, for example, they say, hey, pay us 20% interest and your financials can be however you want. With bank debt, they say, the interest rate is only 5%, but you need to keep this ratio of EBITDA to that interest, which is a type of coverage ratio or any other metric continuously. What are our key takeaways? The first is that bank loans, in fact, any type of loan, are either term loans or evolving. A term loan means one quantity of capital for one maturity, while a revolving credit facility means lending and repaying as many times as you wish under that limit. Think of credit cards. Then, there are a lot of different types of corporate debt, which are asset-based lending. And specifically, they're used to finance temporary assets, which are usually inventory, accounts receivable, equipment, investments, or purchase orders. They're temporary assets that are always liquidated to pay back the debt. So for example, borrowing $1 million based on inventory that will be liquidated one month from now, or borrowing $200 million based on a purchase order that will be liquidated three months from now, or borrowing one billion based on your portfolio company participations that will be liquidated 10 years from now. Then we have trade finance products. Many that products help companies with trade finance, that is, international situations, which may be unpredictable. This includes letters of credit, which increase confidence for both parties because the bank assures that the goods will be paid for but only when they arrive or for example financing production of stock to satisfy purchase orders bank products also exist for project finance these consist of financing long-term projects which yield returns hopefully as they're being developed which in turn are used to repay the loan over time. These are usually government infrastructure projects, but not necessarily. Then we have leases, usually a form of asset-based lending. They consist not of obtaining capital, but obtaining equipment or a vehicle and paying interest on those borrowed assets. And if the borrower takes ownership, they can be liquidated after. In other words, you can borrow 100 million to lease a fleet of Mercedes for five years and then take ownership of them after those five years to sell them and then lease new Mercedes. And finally, loans are usually syndicated. Most bank loans are not performed with the bank's own capital, but instead by syndicated lenders, which are usually private debt investors. There is usually an arranger and the manager that may be the same or not, and which both charge fees for finding and managing the deal, respectively. So as we see, bank debt products are usually senior, secured, and they always use instruments that are above investment grade. And when they're targeted at corporations, they usually have a specific purpose, such as financing, trade, or inventory, or others.